Next on Viewpoint, are the biblical views on sexual behavior still relevant today? Sex is not the number one priority in marriage. Holiness is the number one priority in marriage. A professor shares how he had to learn to forgive himself after his divorce. People in the church were far more accepting of the fact that I was going through a thing than I was. And later, does God want his people in poverty or prosperity? The difference between wealth and poverty is your heart. This is a program that discusses issues of faith for people looking for answers. This is Viewpoint with Bob Placey. In a recent article in HarvestUSA.org, John Freeman wrote that the church has adopted an I'm okay, you're okay attitude about what goes on in the bedroom. Rather than share the rather clear direction God gives us in the Bible about sex, Jonathan Berkey is a contributor to Viewpoint. He's also an adjunct professor at Bluffton College and a pastor. And he's here as a husband and father as well to talk about, of all things today, sex. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a recent, there's a recent report, it goes clear back to 2014, that was surveyed people who self-identified themselves as Christians on the Christian dating website, Christian Mingle. Never heard of it myself, but it's on Christian Mingle. The survey revealed 61% said they are willing to have casual sex without being in love. Not only not being married, but without being in love. And that was 61% of Christians on a Christian dating website said they are okay with trying ca casual sex. Sounds like the message that sex is only for marriage has kind of gotten lost. Uh, what are you seeing, as you, especially as a professor? I mean, yeah. We've seen a lot of young people. Yeah, so I think we have to recognize that culturally there are people that identify as Christian. And so those numbers are, are skewed in the sense that they're representative of people who just are loosely affiliated that. with Christ. And they go to Christian Mingle to find a nice, clean person. Yeah, <laughs> right, think. right. But really, um, I think that a majority of those people probably are not as committed to a Christian fellowship or to the church, right? Now, I say that, but I would also say that in the church, generally, we have become lax on our teaching about sexuality in the last 50 or 60 years. Since the sexual revolution really began back in the 70s, and I mean, it really picked up steam. Yeah, as, as a result of cultural shifts. Mm -hmm. But I think that you still will find faithful Christian people recognizing that the Bible does teach abstinence, and the Bible does teach self-control right. as maxims as guides for our sexual appetites. Well, here's another, another quote. This is from the Huffington Post. Uh, it's an article by the religious columnist, Carol Caravilla. Uh, she concluded, it's time to get real. There's no such thing as a traditional Christian sexual ethic. There's no such thing as a traditional Christian uh, sexual ethic. Often skeptics will point out that, you know, in the Bible you've got incest, you've got polygamy, you've got uh, all kinds of affairs going on that and that there isn't really a valid view that you can pull from the Bible about your sexual life. She may be right about a traditional view, mm -hmm. but as far as a Christian view, she would be completely wrong. The Bible definitely teaches different ideals for sexual ethics in the New Testament. Um, furthermore, just because the Bible has examples of whatever you may have just mentioned, polygamy yeah. or engagement in some sort of incest all kinds of things. yeah sexual practice that isn't healthy just because the bible includes those things as descriptive doesn't mean that the bible is including them as suggestive or normative and i i think that the way that we read the bible we can twist the bible to say whatever we want and we have done that as a culture we've done that as a society so for me i don't really like having the conversation of what does the bible say versus what it doesn't say because as is demonstrated by the by the point you yeah. made, people can twist the Bible to say whatever they well, want they it to say. say well, and if it's in the Bible, it's okay. Well, that's not true. The Bible is maybe condemning that thing that they're that they're that's being talked about. Sure, it's, it's not uh, necessarily sure. that's con condoning it. As a pastor and as a father as well, I mean, a lot of times we parents get lost on how to talk to children, to talk to their young people about sex, and uh, the church may be late to this party about the sexual revolution. That they, they've they've just stopped talking about it because they think it's off limits. Parents don't want to talk about it. The kids are going to learn about it in school. When they get into the eighth grade, they're going to have this course on sex. I don't have to even talk about it anymore. But then you, you lose your, your ability to impart a biblical perspective. No, that's exactly right. Sex is a beautiful gift. It's a wonderful mm -hmm. thing. It's something that ought to be celebrated. And like you said, for whatever reason, it's something that we in the church have become afraid of. Well, we in the church are, are the ones who believe that God gave us sex for two really important and wonderful reasons, for reproduction and for pleasure. Mm -hmm. 
Sex is amazing because of those things. And it has its rightful place in our lives if used correctly, but we haven't, we haven't been teaching very well about the place of sex in the life of a holistic adult. Are, are we paying a price? I mean, we talk about the sexual revolution, paying a price for things like pornography and fantasy lives and whatever it is, romance novels. Are we paying a price for that in marriages? I mean, you talk about, people talk about their marriages now are more open. People talk about, well, we're swingers, we've got an open marriage. Uh, I can go either way. Uh, I can, we, we're using pornography to help our sex life. Think, has, it, has it damaged marriage itself? One of the things that I think is really interesting when I watch the nightly news is how many Cialis or Viagra commercials there are. Yeah, there you go. You got trying to pill. Yeah. trying to supplement, help people in their older age as naturally, biologically, our sexual drive decreases. Mm -hmm. Trying to help that drive stay, stay at the same level of our appetite and as our an addiction. An eighteen-year-old. <laughs> yeah, because we've become so out of control with our sexual appetites. Mm -hmm. What I would say is to to a couple that is wanting to supplement their sex life in the bedroom with pornography or swinging or whatever it may mm -hmm. be, I would try to help them realize that their priorities as a Christian couple have probably gotten off a bit if they're trying to supplement their sexual, their sexual, their sex life by introducing mm -hmm. people outside of the bedroom or objects outside of the bedroom the, the hope of a Christian marriage is not just to have an awesome mm -hmm. sex life. Sex is not the number one priority in marriage. Holiness is the number one priority in marriage. Becoming more Christ-like is the number one priority in marriage. Being a reproductive cu couple, physically, biologically, and spiritually. Mm -hmm. Hospitality is a much higher priority in Christian marriage than point. sex. Yeah. And so, if you're spending all of your time as a couple trying to enhance your sex life, as a Christian couple, you ought to be asking the question, are our priorities in the right place? And I would argue probably not. Let's, let's get closer to the edge then, or further from the edge, maybe over the edge, I'm not sure. The whole idea of, of pornography, addiction, uh, self-gratification, uh, and, and it, it's, it's, not just, it's not just a male problem anymore. We're seeing that the, the whole idea of, of sexual fantasy is, is taking over in, the, in, in, in women's lives as yeah, well. Yeah, I think I heard that uh, Fifty Shades of Grey is the number one selling paperback in history, and it certainly weren't men that were buying that, no, and, that and book, right? It, that, that amazed me, but at the same time, where, where do you go with that when someone says, well, I love my wife, or I love my husband, whatever. It's not enough. I'm reading these romance novels, I'm watching porn on my, f my smartphone or whatever, and that's nobody's business but my own. It's self-gratification. So really, this, this is no longer a Christian conversation, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. when, you start, when, we start saying, when we start having a conversation about my needs, gratifying my desires, yeah. we're, not, we're not being guided by a Christ-like perspective, a selfless perspective. Paul but says- But are we saying, well, well Christ doesn't care. He'll look, you know, it's, it's, it's what I'm doing for myself. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not hurting anybody else. Well, the, the minute that you say, I'm a follower of Jesus, you resign yourself to not being your own. Paul right. says, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. Christ. Therefore, honor God with your body. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, he says, who is in you. Um, we have this perspective that my body is my own. We have this yeah. idea of privatized Christianity that creeps into the bedroom in the sense or not into the bedroom, really just into my private mm -hmm. life, into my fantasy life. And if you're being controlled by your appetite of sexuality more than being guided by a paradigm of, of Christ as Lord, mm -hmm. then really you're probably walking away from Christ from and Christ. You're, not, you're not being guided in a way that I would find to be Christian. Now, there will be people out there that but disagree want to, with people me. People want affirmed, and that's, that's sure. I'm looking for affirmation. But there's people out there that are watching, of course, that uh, say, oh, yeah, they, they, they've really hit a nerve here, and I, I'm not sure what to do with it now. They've hit this nerve. And you can talk to somebody about, uh, I, I did this thing wrong, I did that thing wrong, you can confess a sin. When it gets to sexual ethics, gets to sexual topics, it gets really dicey for people to, conf to confess that. Many people who come into my office who say I have a problem with pornography, for example, what they are doing is they're essentially admitting that they look at pornography mm -hmm. and act on it, but they're not really saying I want a change. They just have felt a nudge, I need to, a conviction I need to confess, to confess it. right? I need to confess it. 
Um, and it's good to confess. I would encourage people to confess. But you're not going to come to a, a point of change until you come to a point of brokenness and realize this is ruining my mindset. This mm -hmm. is ruining my worldview. This is ruining my marriage. This mm -hmm. must stop. There really needs to become a place of repentance for, for anyone who's addicted to these types of, types of things. And once you've come to that place, oftentimes you become humble enough to recognize, I need other people in my life to help to me. speak into my life. And there really are great organizations all throughout this country, in America, I mean, really, with probably within an hour of wherever you're watching this episode from, um, whether it be a Celebrate Recovery program or um, some sort of anonymous program mm -hmm. for people who have struggled with addictions, and even men's or women's groups at local churches, that people that can come alongside of you and help, help you, the people that I've seen have most success getting out of some sort of sexual addiction are people who have come to a place of brokenness and repentance, which has moved them to a place of accountability with some sort of small group community mm -hmm. Where people are With, checking on them, checking in. And they're living into a new reality together. Sexual freedom is possible. It's not just, it's not just a hopeful end, it's a possible end. Coming up, recovery after a divorce. If you're going to enter into a new relationship, you better make sure that you're whole first. There's almost no difference in the numbers of divorces between those who say they're Christians and those who aren't. The church is doing more than ever to reach out to those who've been through a divorce, but the person who's the most unforgiving often is the person who went through the divorce in the first place. Mark Youngkin is a professor at Valor Christian College and wrote the book Make Like Lazarus, and he's got a real perspective on divorce and remarriage because, Mark, uh, your first marriage ended in divorce. It did. Uh, I was married at the age of uh, 24 mm -hmm. in July of 1984. And we were under the same roof for a little over 11 years. Uh, by the time all the legal rigmarole was, was over with, I was married for uh, 12 and a half years. Now, did you both go into that, into that relationship as, as Christians, thinking God's in the middle of this marriage, or was that kind of a supplementary thing in your, in your life? I was fairly newly saved at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I, had, I was born again at a weekend retreat called the Walk to Emmaus in Cincinnati, Ohio. I'm very familiar with that. Yeah. And later, the church that uh, we attended uh, began Emmaus weekends of, of mm -hmm. their own in Marysville. Uh, my, uh, my former wife uh, attended uh, her weekend in Cincinnati mm -hmm. before we were married, and we believed that we were starting out on a very solid well, it would seem like, yeah, when, you, when you're that excited, uh, I mean, the walk to Emmaus, if people haven't, aren't familiar with it, but it, you'd come out of that weekend and be fired up and think, okay, God's going to do something in my life. I'm going to do something with God, and here's this new relationship that should be perfect. That was the idea, yeah. yeah. And that's, that's obviously the goal of every couple mm -hmm. that uh, gets married. But we had a lot of challenges. In retrospect, we probably shouldn't have gotten married in the first mm -hmm. place. Well, let, let's switch gears here. I mean, the divorce occurred. It happened. You're a believer. Uh, you just, you're giving up on the marriage. Do you give up on God at the same time, thinking, well, he didn't make this thing work. Where do I go with the Lord? The best decision I made at that point in my life, Bob, and I can't explain why I made this decision, I dived into the Word of God mm -hmm. uh, and also threw myself into my, my career did, as did, well. Okay, so, you're, you're, so you didn't feel like a failure. I absolutely knew that I had failed. You'd failed. But I was determined. But you weren't, you weren't dwelling in that failure. I was determined to come back from it okay. somehow, whatever okay. that meant. And if it meant that I would be single for the rest of my life at this point at the age of 36 or 37, mm -hmm. then I was willing to do that. Um, subconsciously, and what I tell people going through divorce today, is that if you're going to enter into a new relationship, you better make sure that you're whole first. Right. Um, and not carrying a lot of the baggage from yeah, you. Yeah, when you go through a divorce, you, you're, you're broken, damaged, no matter how amicably mm -hmm. that supposedly plays sure. out. So it takes some time to recover mm -hmm. from that. I want to go back to something you said. You said you wouldn't have ministry if you were still in that other marriage. How does the church look on that? I mean, you're coming out of a church and, and we know that God hates divorce. I mean, he says that in his word. How do you get into ministry 
out of a divorce. I mean, how does the church look at that? I did a deep dive as part of my research for the book into what God really says about divorce. And at the time, my concern was, can I remarry if it ever comes to that? Right. It turns out that there's two explicit uh, conditions where someone who is divorced can remarry. One is uh, if an unfaithful spouse strays, not just once, but as mm -hmm. a habitually as a, right. as a lifestyle. So if there's adultery or fornication involved. And, and that was, that was Jesus' term. I believe it's in the gospel someplace. And then Paul adds, if the unbelieving spouse chooses to leave, you let them. Let them go. And that was my situation. Uh, implicitly, I believe that if someone is divorced before they become a believer, then it is permissible mm -hmm. to remarry. The sin uh, that it's un, under the, the grace of, of Christ. I mean, it's all of our sin comes under that. Under exactly. That Second Corinthians 5 and 17, we use in so many other contexts. Mm -hmm. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new, new creation, creation. Yeah. You're, which means that you're not this new, improved, whitewashed, you know, new coat of paint version of who you were before. You're somebody entirely mm -hmm. new. And eventually uh, there, there was a new person in your life. Yeah, I mean, you said you were decided that if God wants me to remain single, I'll remain single. But apparently he didn't. Well, after a while, I started looking at, we didn't have Christian Mingle at the time. We didn't have eHarmony <laughs> at the time. Go online what we had was the uh, personal ads in the Columbus Dispatch. Yeah. I remember that her ad said that she was looking for someone who had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So she just laid it right out there yeah. that that's exactly what she was looking for. About a month later, we, uh, we uh, went to dinner shortly after the 4th of July, and that was 21 years ago, and the rest is history. Two people I want you to speak to right now. One is the, the, the couples in the church, people in the church, families in the church, who see a, a, a couple going through divorce, or somebody who's been damaged by divorce, what can they do and say that uh, in some way is going to minister to their, to their brokenness? One of the things that, that was most hurtful when, when I was first divorced, first separated, is that there are so many people that feel like they have to choose sides. I've got to go with him or I've got to go with her and, you know, team A or team mm -hmm. B and never the twain shall meet. Divorced people are hurting. Acknowledging that there's hurting is probably the best thing that, that you can do. Some people, I would suggest particularly single parents, single mothers mm -hmm. at that time who were you know, try, all of a sudden raising children yeah, alone, sure. might be the most vulnerable. And I would be in particular, I would be particularly concerned with what needs can you meet. The other person I want you to address is that person who's gone through it. They're, they're trying to get back into church. They, there's a lot of guilt. There's a lot of brokenness. We know how they feel. Uh, what would you say to them right now to encourage them? What I found, at least, was that people in the church were far more accepting of the fact that I was going through a thing than I was that I was going through a thing. It, you know, forgiveness is a big topic in the book, and, and, and you often need to forgive yourself, absolutely. In the book, Make Like Lazarus, a biblical perspective on divorce and remarriage. W tell me about the name real quick. <laughs> Make like Lazarus. Lazarus wasn't divorced, was he? Lazar <laughs> not to my knowledge. <laughs> Lazarus was not divorced. Mm -hmm. He had more problems than that. He was, <laughs> yes, dead. He was dead. He was dead. I was reading that passage in John 11. Lazarus was not raised by his own strength. Lazarus was dependent on God, and he was dependent on, on others. And finally, importantly, uh, Lazarus was obedient. Imagine that you're in the tomb and you hear Lazarus <laughs> come forth. I'm not supposed to come out of the grave. I'm dead. And I see people in my role in ministry. I see students who have daunting tuition bills to pay that have their, their one parents in prison and the other one strung out on drugs. And yet God says to them, come forth, I've got something more for you to do. And you have to decide that you're going to do that, that you're going to be obedient, that, 
that he who was faithful to begin a good work in you is going also going to be faithful to complete it. Even though things aren't looking so good right now, he's calling you to more. Coming up. The difference between rich and poor is money. The difference between wealth and poverty is your heart. Does God want his people in poverty or prosperity? The prosperity teaching in the church has drawn a lot of controversy since the very beginning of the church. Does the Bible bring clarity to this very confusing topic? Well, Terry Dismore is a consultant and a Christian broadcaster who shares with me his viewpoint on the subject of prosperity from his life experiences as a husband and a businessman. This is where people have trouble with prosperity, I think, is they don't think they deserve it. With the, with the prosperity doctrine or just being prosperous? Just being prosperous. Just being pro what, what's the definition of that? Of prosperity? Yeah. Uh, it is having more than enough. More than enough. Of what? Whatever you need. More than enough friends, more than enough time. And here's the hard part for a lot of people that are believers, more than enough money. Mm -hmm. Money is a tool. And God never said in His Word that money was the root of all evil. It's the the love it, of the it. The love of money. So what are we supposed to have love for? God. Mm -hmm. That's where love comes from. Now, the love of anything can get, us, get in the way of our, of our devotion to God and our, our, our sure. following of Jesus Christ. You know, uh, family can become an idol, and so can money. Mm -hmm. And when we say, well, I don't want it because it could become an idol, now you've got a problem. Yeah, I, because I, I, God uses that through us as a conduit yeah. to, to bless other people, to go into missions, to do lots of things. The money can do, the, as you say, as a tool, can do the work, but it's got to flow through us. It's got to flow fairly, right. fairly easily and loosely. Well, yeah, that's it why he says... The, the end result can't be our desire to get the money. Right. Now, the problem with it is that we run into is in, when, uh, in Luke 6, 38, when Jesus is speaking and he said, Give, and it will be given unto you. Mm -hmm. Press down, down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give unto your bosom. With the measure you use, so shall it be measured back to you. In that verse, who gives back to you? Men. Yeah, not God. And that's mm -hmm. God speaking. What did he mean? He meant that it came from other people. Mm -hmm. Because God doesn't have a checkbook. He uses ours. He doesn't really need any money. No. What does he need it for? It's a tool that man has. So when we say, well, I don't want it, it's usually because we don't think we deserve it. And it's because, I believe, we have a mentality of an orphan, meaning that our father's not going to take care of us because I don't really have one. Mm -hmm. I call him my father, but he's not really my father. He's not going to supply. We believe for some reason he's not going to supply. Yeah, and, and sometimes it's experience. We don't get a check when we think we're going to get a check. There are a lot of people that give to get. Right. Now, there's a problem with that. The principle is, if you give, you will get. But if you give to get, you've got a problem yeah. because you're doing it for the wrong, wrong reason. reason. The so, money's the motivator. Yeah. And the money's the, the, money's the target. So, so you ever been in an airplane? Several thousand miles. Now, a million mile guy. Are you really? Yeah. With who? Delta. Oh. You want some points? Yeah. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> well, I'm a Southwest guy, <laughs> okay. so there you go. <laughs> I get the best seat in the house. I took flying lessons. For, you ever taken a flying lesson? No. All right. So one of the first things I learned in flying was this. On a fixed-wing airplane, mm -hmm. if you get it going fast enough, it'll fly. Why? Because it's made to fly. Yes, it is. It's, that's what it's made it's gonna, for. It's going to lift. It is going to lift. And the law of lift takes off if you get going fast enough. Mm -hmm. Now, in a jet like a Southwest jet or a Delta jet, that's about 125 knots. If you get going 200 and it's still on the ground, there's a problem. You got a problem. Yeah. So it's the same way with money. Money is a tool, and money will work for you or against you. And if you put it in the wrong hands, and by that sure. I mean you put it in the enemy's hands, it'll work against you. The same way is if you hold on to it, if it doesn't flow through right. you. So um, there's a verse in Jeremiah, I think, chapter 2, that says, For my people have built for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that won't hold water, when I am the spring of living water. But the problem with a spring is you don't know where it comes from, and you don't know how much there is. But the cistern, you can measure what you have. Mm -hmm. So when we have a rich mentality as opposed to a wealth mentality, 
we can see how rich we are. But when we're wealthy, sometimes we can't see how wealthy we are. The difference between, so I tell, I, the, the insurance company that I helped start was called WealthSmart. And it died a very, you know, like a flame-throwing, multiple injury Christ death. And burn. Yeah, it was bad. But I learned something interesting. When I was trying to tell people about this, I wanted to bring biblical principles in. And one of the things that I said is there's a difference between being rich and being wealthy. The difference between rich and poor is money. The difference between wealth and poverty is your heart. Because a pov- there are, so if you think about, you know some people have got a lot of money mm-hmm. and they're terrified of losing it. So they actually have a poverty mentality. They believe in the lack of wealth, not in the lack of money. They have the money. They believe they're going to lose it. So uh, poverty is a fear of a lack of wealth. The purpose of Viewpoint is to help bring answers to some of the most common questions and some of the most perplexing questions in today's culture. Well, I'd like to encourage you, dig deeper into God's Word to develop your own viewpoint. If you don't already have a church, it's a great place to start. Find a good Bible-believing church. That's the place to take your questions and get answers for your own life.